Hi, and welcome to today's event, Key Skills Sought by Employers Following the Global Pandemic. My name is Karen Butler Henderson, and I'm going to be your facilitator for today's event. I'd like to start today by providing an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Wurrung and Burrung language groups of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Colour Nations. And I pay my respects to the elders, both those past, present, future and emerging. I acknowledge these ancestors and elders, and I also acknowledge the traditional custodians. So thank you for joining us for today's event. This is an initiative that's uh, led by the RMIT Digital Education Engagement Initiative. This is an initiative that was established um, back in March 2020 by a multidisciplinary team of senior leaders from the en Enabling Impact Platforms from Learning and Teaching, Digital Innovation and Digital Health in the STEM College to have um, a collaborative approach to be able to deliver several events to address and focus on the digital futures for social innovation and education. So this group was created as a response um, to the post COVID-19 restarts initiative by the previous enabling capability platforms, uh, consisting of several leaders. And, and since its establishment over the, this is our fourth year, we've organized more than seven events, published three briefing papers in collaboration with external stakeholders. Um, and now the Digital Education Engagement Initiative is pleased to be able to hold this event with several key um, industry leaders that we're going to be hearing from today. Just before we start, I'd like to talk briefly about some house rules. This event um, will have a Q&A section at the end. We won't be taking questions immediately after the presentations, but I encourage you throughout the presentations, if you have a question for any of our speakers, to please post it into the Q&A section and we'll make sure that our speakers are aware of your questions and we can address them at the end of today's session. Please do post them throughout the session so we can have a really engaging conversation with some fantastic speakers that we have. If you want to address it to a particular person, please put their name in caps lock and we'll make sure that they are notified of your question. This session is being recorded and you are able to um, access the recording at a later stage. And for further information about both this initiative and about our enabling impact platforms, please do look on the RMIT website. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. It gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce our very first speaker. Mark Seaton is the Manager Solution Architecture for Amazon Web Services or AWS. Mark is um, based here for, but he covers Australia, New Zealand, Oceania. He holds degrees from the University of Edinburgh and the Open Universities in Software Engineering, Informatics and International Politics. Currently based here in Melbourne, Mark uses his professional experience gained over 20 years in diverse leadership roles across organisations in Europe, Northern America and Australia to build high functioning teams that drive impactful technological solutions. He enjoys combining his passion for lifelong learning with relentless focus on supporting others to shine. This is reflected in his current hiring role and developing early career professionals at AWS as they solve problems for public sector customers across the region. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, hi, super happy to be here talking with you folks. Always a little nervous to go first, but uh, let's get started. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to be briefly covering Amazon Web Services or AWS, who we are and how we work, particularly around architecture, organization and culture. Culture will lead us onto our leadership principles or LPs, uh, the 16 of them, but I'll outline some of the key LPs that I've seen as being important to early careers. And then I'll talk a little bit about why these particular LPs are important for the pandemic. Uh, so next slide, please. So many of you will have heard about Amazon, but AWS was developed because after about a decade of running our e-commerce systems, we'd become really good at running massive technology infrastructure. So we decided to provide developers and businesses with web services that they could use to build sophisticated and scalable applications. We now have over 200 services available today from compute to Internet of Things to machine learning. And there's a couple of different ways in which we're able to move so fast at our scale. Uh, the first is the architecture. 
by developing and then using our own self-service cloud platform, the same one that we provide to customers, there's now no gatekeepers to technology. Builders don't need to wait for in line for storage, compute, databases, or even to start using machine learning. They can just start building. This democratizes innovation because people know if they have an idea over the weekend, they can come into work on a Monday and see if it works. So thinking big and inventing and simplifying two of our leadership principles, they're now available to everyone. The second is around organization. We've got the tech, but now we need to find the right people. So we hire builders, we, we hire people who like to invent. People like to look at different customer experiences, pull them apart and then improve them. And we need to organize these builders so they can build. We organize into two pizza teams. Uh, the so-called because they should be small enough that they can only be fed by two pizzas. This keeps them small, nimble and focused on one goal. This sense of moving uh, fast or bias for action is another of our leadership principles, which brings me on to our culture. Uh, so last but not least is our culture. Uh, it's defined by our leadership principles, the 16 of them. You can see them online and at AWS and Amazon more broadly. We hold both ourselves and each other accountable for demonstrating these LPs every day. They describe how we do business, how we lead and how we keep the customer at the center of everything that we do. I could talk for hours about each one. I'll, I'll talk about a little about them, but I'm just going to focus on three, which I believe are key to graduates being successful at AWS. So next slide, please. So the first is uh, learn to be curious. Uh, we're never done learning. We never believe we know everything and we're intensely curious about everything, whether that's a new technology, a new industry domain or a new approach to working. We believe that great leaders put themselves into new and challenging situations to increase their knowledge and practice flexibility because change brings discomfort. It's often disorientating. Skills we've mastered are no longer as useful. Approaches we know are no longer as valid, but change is a tremendous opportunity for learning and growth. And it's this curiosity that drives our ability to events on behalf of our customers. We ask not only why does it work that way, but also what are the ways could we get this to work? And I wonder what would happen if, and it's this questioning that leads us on to ownership. Uh, next slide, please. Ownership is a critical skill at AWS, particularly given our flat structure. We think long term, we make commitments, commitments to customers and to each other, and we keep them. We respectfully challenge our peers, our managers and each other. If you see something that's not right, if you've got ownership, you respectfully bring that up, but also be part of making it better. So that's asking questions, it's con considering future outcomes, whether things are scalable, have long-term value, whether they're meaningful for customers. And it helps us give feedback, coach and develop others, whether that's peers, associates, or even our managers. And next slide, please. The last is bias for action. Among other things, bias for action shows up as initiative. It means being willing to pick up the phone when you sent an email and haven't received a response, when walking to another office or even another building. It means finding another task to work on when you're waiting for a code review. It means, it means uh, being prepared and not expecting others to do the work for you. It means doing what it make takes to make sure the job gets done and done properly. It also means being impatient when there's a customer problem. It's not waiting for approval before doing something you know is the right thing to do for the customer. Uh, so how did the LPs help us during the pandemic? Uh, next slide, please. A bias for action showed up in the way we help customers during the pandemic, moving as fast as they needed to, and often trying circumstances to provide them with the services they need to help their customers or citizens. Whether that was a contact center stood up in a matter of days or a COVID test notification system developed in a couple of weeks. In these situations, speed really matters. We all had to exercise a little learn and be curious when it came to changes in ways of working from remote onboarding, shifting to remote whiteboarding, using iPads and other tools when we got used to using marker pens. It was often uncomfortable and disorientating, but we asked how things could be better and we improved our, approach, improved our approaches over time. This also had an effect on early careers. It changed the changed ways of working had significant impacts on graduates entering our workforce. We relied on the tried and trusted approaches of shadowing meetings, um, being located in the same offices and serendipitous this connection making. But we all had to take a much, much more ownership of the development of others, giving the feedback, creating networks through intentional mentoring, more regular one on ones and more active coaching. So in this very brief talk, I've tried to outline how we think about doing business at AWS, what skills we think are important in line with our, with our RPs and why this mattered during the pandemic. Thanks very much for listening to me. I'll hand over back to Karen. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, some really interesting thoughts that um, you've shared with us and we look forward to discussing them further. And please, if you have any questions for Mark, please put them into the Q&A. <coughs> Our next speaker is Megan Lee, the study coordinator and committee chair 
for the Australian New Zealand Gynecological Oncology Group. Excuse me. <laughs> So Megan is the Queensland Research Coordinator State Manager for ICON Research and chairs the ANSCOG Study Coordinator Committee. Looking after clinical trial teams across medical oncology, hematology and radiation oncology, she is keen, um, has a keen interest in new site development, early phase research and is passionate about education. As a GCP trainer, Megan has facilitated countless training sessions across all divisions of our organisation and is currently participating in an internal future leaders forum where she will be proposing education initiatives, sports services and advocating for equal health care access for rural, regional and remote patients. Please join me in welcoming Megan. Thank you so much. So as Karen so gladly described, um, I wear two hats. Um, if you put, pop the next slide on, please. Um, my role at Icon takes about three quarters of my life and, and also um, the next slide screen. Um, so we run mainly pharmaceutical sponsored trials, um, testing new therapies on our patients. Um, we also run collaborative group studies, um, which largely aim to get these therapies approved onto the PBS. Um, so there's greater access to the Australian nation. Um, ANSCOG is one of these groups that we work with, um, it's the Australian New Zealand Ghani Oncology Group. And my role in the chair, as the chair of the study coordinator committee is really lending the SARTS perspective to protocol and consent form development for their studies. Next slide, please. So everyone is well aware of the long lasting effects that COVID's had on the healthcare sector. Um, but until I was asked to speak to you, I didn't really stop to think about um, our next generation of healthcare workers and how COVID had really um, affected their journey. I for one wouldn't um, have um, the scarf on my cheek um, if it wasn't for, if I was in lockdown during COVID, um, a lot of bad decisions probably wouldn't have been made. So I guess there are some positives um, in um, all of the lockdowns that we went through. Um, but social media was also only taking um, effect when I was starting my professional career. So my digital footprint really wasn't affected by any of the bad decisions I made in my youth. Um, and that's not really the case today. So I really wanted to focus um, my next slide um, on our first impressions, which are really looking at that, uh, that digital footprint. We no longer um, have the luxury of um, doing things face to face um, and the very first impressions really do count. I receive upwards of 50 applicants for every one of my graduate, graduate entry roles. And it's really easy to dismiss someone for poor spelling mistakes or confusing layout in their CV. So getting the basics of CV writing correct is absolutely essential to that first impression. One thing that um, is becoming a little bit more popular that I absolutely love um, is a hyperlink or a QR code directly to their LinkedIn profile. So in the digital world, um, LinkedIn is the new CV and it can really tell you a lot about a candidate um, beyond just their, um, their degrees and, and some work experience that they've had. So I really do encourage the students to set up a profile, follow appropriate organizations and people, repost your favorite articles. It doesn't even have to be original content. Snap a picture if you happen to do some work experience anyway. Um, we are closely linked to QUT um, Biomedical Science um, graduate program, where I have um, students coming in all the time to see what clinical research is all about. Um, and this is one of the things that I always make sure I spend time with them. Um, going over their CV, LinkedIn and cover letters as well. So cover letters really help um, establish that first impression. It's really where you can tailor it to the organisation, to their values and to the role. And you can highlight your soft skills that aren't necessarily um, highlighted in your CV. So things like your leadership and your values. Um, Archon is an extremely values driven organisation. Um, we uphold them much like um, Amazon seems to as well, um, to a really, really high standard. Um, and if someone had gone through the effort to find out what our company values are and how, that, how they actually portray those values in their life, um, it would be really, really stand out for me. Um, and um, in those 50 applicants, that would definitely be one that I would take a closer look at. So once you've established that first impression, the fun really begins. If you don't mind popping to my next slide, please. Um, so the healthcare setting has many, many challenges um, and in clinical research it brings its own complexities. Um, we are often dealing with patients that have run out of um, treatment options. Um, I'd like to say that we're in the business of hope, um, but that can lead to a lot of compassion fatigue. Um, it's extremely difficult not to blur the lines of your professional and personal um, boundaries. 
There's no one solution or skill um, that I can give you um, any advice on to prevent this. However, um, self-awareness is key. So really promoting introspection and allowing students to identify themselves and identify their values. Um, it'll really encourage them to align that with a profession um, that works towards their values um, and potentially find an organisation out there that will align nicely with that. So they'll have a much better chance um, in this post-COVID world if they are completely self-aware um, and understand um, that that can align to your professional values. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Megan. Again, another thought-provoking presentation. I can already see some questions coming through the Q&A, uh, but again, I encourage our audience to add any further to that um, Q&A chat. Our third speaker today is uh, Klaus Bau, who is the president of the Australian Council of Professions, which is a unifying alliance of professional associations that represent close to 1 million Australian professionals, including engineers, healthcare and computer um, professionals, veterinarians and accountants. Klaus's involvement in medical technology development and implementation spans over 25 years. For several years, Klaus was the CIO of a major healthcare, uh, major Australian um, healthcare corporation. Klaus's research interests include factors determining healthcare data and interoperability standards adoption, as well as the impact of evidence-based professional expert advice on society. He's passionate about e-health, and that's how I know Klaus for a very long time. He's founded nine businesses, as well as three not-for-profit organisations and successfully turned over a dozen entities. He is also an adjunct associate professor in the School of Computing Engineering and Mathematics at Western Sydney University. In this role, he focuses on digital health, health informatics and health information management. Another current role being undertaken by Klaus is that of prime, um, principal partner of Digital Health Education Partners, Reteaches a variety of workshops, courses, and seminars, including the two day intensive HL, HL7 implementation course and the infamous HL7 certification bootcamp. Welcome, Klaus. Thank you very much, Karen. If I could have the first slide, please, uh, about the Australian Council of Professions, which is, as you said, Karen, the Unified Alliance of Professional Associations in Australia. And through our member organisations, we represent about a million professionals um, in this country across all different specialities. So if we go to the next slide, my focus today is um, from that lens, not from an education lens, high education lens, but actually from the lens of um, professionals. Uh, in this um, or peak body of the Australian Council of Professions, we have four areas of advocacy, just for information, education, accreditation, micro-credentials and employability, and that's really germane to our discussion topics here today. Professional and ethics, um, probably also important for professionals. Diversity, culture and inclusion, I think we need to exercise that wherever we are. And of course, climate action, that's our fourth area of advocacy. Um, <clears throat> this is particularly propagated by two global firsts. We've appointed a chief professionalist and a chief futurist, um, but that's just flanking information. Now moving to the two focal areas that I want to talk about in my uh, few minutes today um, is um, the next um, is the two post pandemic um, challenges that we certainly are um, um, uh, dealing with as professionals. The first is the changed professional skills. I mean, we all know about working remotely. Um, for professionals in particular, there's a challenge of gaining new clients without person-to-person -person contacts. The usual places where you find new cl clients, um, etc., aren't quite exist anymore. Um, you might have to actually gain a new client and new um, by um, online per, um, means entirely. So that's something. Resources now need to be accessed remotely. You can't just go to the local library or you can go to local university or the campus or the local um, um, branch of your professional association. It has to be done remotely. Also, our relationships between peers now need to be maintained um, you know, uh, um, remotely. 
um, because even though the pandemic is notionally over, a um, lot of the work habits continue. Um, we need to maintain our continued professional um, um, education and professional development, and many professional associations have completely moved over to delivering that online. And last but not least, and Megan mentioned that, is the separation of work and life. When we are basically working maybe from our kitchen or from our office preferably, um, we need to find when does our workday start and when does our workday finish. So that's one focal area, the change professional skills. On the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of and opportunities of artificial intelligence AI for professionals. Um, so what our experience has been as professionals is, you know, products like ChatGPT's quality of professional advice is astounding. I mean, we have done a few experiments and we find that what ChatGPT brings out is pretty close to what um, a professional, a reasonably qualified professional would say. And that's in one way a threat, in one way also an opportunity um, because it allows professional advice to be provided in a much larger quantity and much broader um, uh, spread than um, uh, prior to the advent of this level of AI. One of the problems, it's as difficult to distinguish. Many of you may have heard about the poor lawyer that was um, admonished in court when he um, cited a number of precedences and former cases that he relied on that didn't actually exist. ChatGP just, just made them up. And obviously um, he was very much red faced there in court. Um, and because anybody can use ChatGPT, um, and that's just an example of AI, um, the question is, you know, how do we then make sure that the advice that's provided, uh, the professional advice, actually has the quality that we're looking for? And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, fake facts. Uh, another great example is uh, a uh, IT journalist, uh, Chat GPT himself, as in the new version of Googling yourself, and he found that he had died and uh, a couple of years ago, and looking deep, deeper, there was actually a bitchery about him um, that was published somewhere. Uh, there was a link to where it was published, but it didn't actually exist. So these are really big challenges for you know professionals out there um, who are working and working in an environment where um, you know artificial intelligence is becoming ubiquitous. And that brings me basically to me to the end of my summary. Um, Karen, um, over back to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Klaus. And um, uh, I'm amazed we actually made it through to this before, point before me mentioning ChatGPT. Um, thank you very much. And again, we look forward to your questions in the Q&A. And that brings us to our last speaker, who is David Pook. He is currently the, the Melbourne Centre Manager for Boeing Research and Technology Australia and is responsible for leading an enterprise-wide research portfolio focused on advancing composite materials, structures, manufacturing, and automation technologies. Tr prior to joining BR&T, A, David held various leadership positions and technical signatory for a diverse range of engineering design, manufacturing, research, and product development roles across commercial and military sides of the business. David's highlights include the CASA or CASA Weight and Balance Authority, Evolved Sea Sparrow Missile or ESSM, the FA18 and the EF programs, and Boeing Aerostructure Australia's 787 MQ28A, um, the 777 and the 737 programs. He received his BA in aerospace from RMIT. Welcome, David. Yeah, thank thank you, Karen, and, and thank you for working through the acronyms and abbreviations that are that are heavily in the uh, engineering and especially aerospace industry speak. Well, thank you for having me here this morning. Um, I'll talk briefly just around uh, the work that Boeing Research and Technology does in Australia. We have you know two key sites within the team, one in Brisbane uh, and one in Melbourne. And we are part of the um, Boeing Australia team, of which there are over um, 5,000 
um, employees you know, across the business. But uh, I'll, I'll talk a little today about um, you know, what I see in sort of my knot hole in BRT in, in Melbourne. Um, primarily uh, you know, the role of, of research and technology for a, an engineering company and a technology company like Boeing is to develop cutting edge, cutting edge technology and really change the game. And, and when you look at products like you know, 787, um, when you look at the, uh, the MQ-28 or the GhostBat, for instance, um, both those platforms, we call them, uh, really made step changes in, in performance, uh, connectivity, and also you know, meeting customer expectations. Um, delivering value to a business that is global um, you know, can be can be tough, um, but but delivering value locally uh, is, is really critical. And leveraging the Australian uh, industry, the Australian landscape, and also Australian talent is key to our success. Um, so we we ensure that we partner and collaborate where it makes sense. Um, you know, across across the enterprise you know, internationally, but also uh, local universities, government agencies, and industry really need to pull together, especially in early phases of, uh, of aerospace technology. It's, it's a highly regulated business and uh, for very good reason. And um, you know, the, the sort of lead times we have on some of our technologies and programs you know, require that. Um, and I guess you know, final key point for the, the work that we do um, is to identify and grow talent pipelines. And, and the same themes that you heard from um, the previous speakers, it's, it's our people that make things happen. And, and really you know, leveraging what we what we have in Australia um, and leveraging the know-how and also the um, the, the, the go-to attitude uh, that, that we seek in Australia is really important. Um, next slide, thanks. So just wanted to talk a little, um, we've recently been through um, you know, graduate recruitment. Uh, we're all flying, uh, aircraft orders are picking up and the world's opening up from COVID. Um, obviously, the aerospace industry and the um, airline industry was hit very hard in that space, but uh, we're, we're on a massive curve now of, of increasing uh, rates, increasing uh, travel and increasing you know, demand for product. Um, first and foremost, you know, for, for the engineering work, strong fundamental knowledge is really important so that the work the students do, the work that uh, academia uh, and industry uh, come together to ensure that uh, programs are meaningful, programs are impactful and uh, and really what we're looking for is um, is um, passion for the for the work and so you know a range of fields there are, are, the, are what we expect um, and, and we expect people to come in with uh, you know fundamentals through that um, a, a point of difference you know that work-life balance that we'll, we'll see probably come up through the uh, the talk is really critical but uh, on our sites um, you know around Australia around the world and even Port Melbourne it's, a, it's what we call a pretty rich environment. You've got people, you've got automation, you've got people and automation working together, uh, and that's increasingly uh, happening, as well as um, you know, scale of, of products, you know, whole aircraft or whole sections of aircraft are being designed, fabricated and built. Um, it's particularly you know, exciting for people coming out of the pandemic to, to be on a site with so much activity. Um, you know, Model-based engineering or, or digital engineering, um, it, you know, it's it's not become the new norm. It's it's the way that we deliver product quickly, um, and, and so that skills related to um, not just being able to build something by hand, but also to validate and and model uh, and simulate that is um, increasingly important. And in fact, our time to market um, is is making step changes at the moment because we're doing thousands of of trials digitally before we get to the um, you know the hardware development phase. Um, people, uh, you will deliver breakthrough technology, um, agile framework, and you know, if you're familiar with software-based sort of work, an agile framework where we fail early and we make it safe to fail is really important for low low maturity tech and people development. And then, you know, high maturity programs will have an aircraft to meet or a delivery date uh, to hold, and, and we'll use sort of classic structure. So your knowledge and knowledge of teams in, in both those areas is important. It's the agile that's, that's new to us and, uh, and, and really the software um, industry really is leading the way and we're watching carefully that. Um, effective teaming um, is always really important. Our environment is dynamic and um, we get the best involvement of people and, and their own experience um, when, uh, when teams connect 
uh, by working remotely, um, it allows people to get the sort of things done that they'd like to get done uh, away from the uh, the physical space or the physical factory. Um, but also things happen quickly in a, in a physical factory. And what is fantastic is to see people uh, band together um, and, and uh, corral around problems on site where needed. Um, and that's that's really important for us. Final thing I'll sort of mention around um, experience, especially during the pandemic, uh, working in teams, the sort of things we look like for community, academic, uh, sporting jobs. Um, there was some mention with Megan on leadership uh, experience. It's it's really important for us because uh, you know you will be and people do work with teams. It takes teams of thousands and in fact tens of thousands to build some of our aircraft and platforms and um, and really it's it's quite critical. So that is something we look for in any experience in, in any way. That probably gives you a, a good picture overall and I'll I'll hand it back to uh, to Karen to uh, to pick up the rest of the, um, the session. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. So we've just heard four fantastic presentations that are really quite diverse presentations and are talking about the different skills and capabilities um, that are needed in this new world that we're living in. We're certainly not post pandemic, but it is a very different world um, and it really highlights the importance of this um, topic. First, I want to thank our four presenters that were really engaging, insightful um, presentations. And now I'd like to uh, shift to the Q&A section. We received several questions as part of the registration from you, the audience, um, and our panelists have considered uh, a few of them that we're now going to talk about. But I would also like to, again, encourage you to put any questions you have for our panelists in the chat and we'll make sure that we um, share them with our speakers. But David, you were, um, you know, our most recent speaker, uh, the last presentation. You talked a lot around that skills and capability, and this came through um, a number of times uh, through the questions from our audience. So can I put to you first? What are those critical capabilities and skills required to manage and leverage future challenges for industry? So what we've seen in our industry is, um, you know, with, with, with an engineering you know, he heavy team, you know, the, the, the engineering fundamentals are kind of given that, that we work to that and we work um, in those spaces. What is changing for us, though, and what continues to change for the better, obviously, is that digital connection. And so really our teams being able to um, build, uh, you know, progress, but also trust sharing and working in a dynamic environment. Um, this, the sort of um, skills that we have around um, not online chat, but sort of mattermost uh, posting, um, being connected uh, when a problem arises, um, teams reaching out to each other or sharing the sharing the problem first and allowing that problem to be seen by, by more eyes. Um, what we found now is that instead of one person or two people sort of being on the scene or being at the point for a, a, um, a you know, project or, or a challenge we've had, by, by that digital space and, and sharing information quickly, we can get access to tens or even hundreds of ideas to solve that and, and so that's been amazing and that's one of the things that we really want to uh, to continue to progress um, is you know using the digital tools and, and not just in communication as well um, I mentioned before around um, digital modeling so when we build digital twins and what we call you know uh, you think of a virtual model of an airplane everyone gets that or, or a system um, but the way that that system behaves when we build it the way it behaves in operation and also the way it behaves with our customers. We are now getting much, much more fidelity on, um, on how our systems and platforms are operating because our models are getting more accurate. And we, and we simply never had the skills to do that. We had engineers doing um, you know, hardware and design, but they weren't doing, doing the trials and the tests in that space. So um, yeah, that, that's been really important for us. Great, thank you, David. And and Klaus, being um, the the president of uh, Professions Australia, you've got this really wide view across a number of different areas. Um, same question to you around those skills and capabilities of the future. 
Well, um, I've sort of highlight, started highlighting in my initial presentation, but um, I think mainly the ability to respond and react to the technology and, if you like, cultural changes that um, hit, if you like, the professional workforce. Um, I think um, David was saying about, you know, you might have one or two people putting in ideas, now you have 500 putting in ideas. How do you manage that? What are the management approaches, both personally and, if you like, structurally to address that? That's one. Um, when you have competition as a professional by artificial intelligence, you know, learning ways to basically deal with that, to distinguish and to tell customers, and that could be internal or external customers, um, what the difference is that maybe typing something to chat GPT is not the same of us ask, than asking Klaus, right, or asking David. So I think those are things that um, people need to learn and need to understand and we should promulgate um, those understandings. That might be a first cut at, at an answer there, Karen. Yeah, thanks, Klaus. And Megan, you certainly come from it from our health um, perspective. Is there any unique areas within health that you're seeing emerging? Definitely. I think all of our um, professions really overlap quite a bit, even <laughs> despite the disparities. Um, but really, the skills are, are all soft and uh, needed in healthcare. Um, it's nurture, it's um, connection. Um, between people. So definitely um, very important to have hard skills um, and, and and everything that's been spoken about, but it's it's the soft skills that are really important in healthcare. Yeah, thank you. And and Mark, any final words? Oh, very similar to what the previous folks were saying. Look, in terms of digital digital skills, and obviously I've got a slightly biased view because I work for a cloud organisation, um, but the World Economic Forum estimated by 2025, half the global workforce will need to learn new skills and there'll be 97 million new roles. So this kind of democratisation of access to the skills, that the, the learning of the skills is super important. Um, and so I think that's that's something that we all need to do as industry is make sure that folks have the access to the skills, to learning the skills and capabilities that we need uh, just as much as just expecting them to have it. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to shift um, to another topic that came out um, from the um, pre-session questions, and this was around cultural intelligence. And cultural intelligence, you know, has been defined as the ability to be able to recognise and adapt um, to cultural differences. It's a, and really important because what it can do is it can give the individual the confidence to be able to operate successfully in a really wide range of settings. Um, and it doesn't just refer to um, nationality or ethnicity or religion, it's referring to culture. So I just want to explore this topic with our four panellists. What are your thoughts on the need for cultural intelligence in our future workforce? And um, Megan, I'm going to start with you first. Good thing. Um, we're actually busy um, completely overhauling our orientation program. And one of the things that I have now mandated um, for all of my research staff is um, LGBTQR training as well as Indigenous training. So it's really just opening the eyes up to not everyone looks the same, not everyone wants to be communicated the same way. Something as basic as getting a pronoun right um, can make a huge, huge impact on how a person will be perceived in a, an organisation, how they will respond to you um, and how they can just generally cause that first impression. Um, so, you know, taking it back to my, my talk, it, it's all about first impressions. Um, you can really make or break an entire relationship on the first three seconds that you meet a person. Um, so something like as simple as a pronoun. Just get it right. So um, cultural intelligence, especially in, in our industry, when we're dealing um, with people face to face, um, we don't have a lot of digital um, scope um, on the clinical side of it. So you really have to be able to communicate with people um, in a, a, a very respectful way. Yeah, I want, I love um, that you focus on the, that first three, your, your comment around that first three seconds. It is so important. Um, Klaus, do you have any any um, other insights around um, cultural intelligence of our future well, workforce? 
Absolutely, and I think there's two dimensions of cult intelligence. As um, one is lateral, is like across the spectrum. So we mentioned LGBTQ. Uh, I, we mentioned cult, um, cultures. Uh, as we work more remotely, we're dealing with with peers and professionals, you know, <clears throat> in different cultures, in different sorry, different countries, in different cultures, in different organisations. Things that used to be not were difficult and now easy because of, you know, as David said, the um, electronic facilitation. Um, also, lateral um, competence is dealing with, for instance, um, um, neurodiverse professionals who substantially contribute, especially in the digital area, um, but um, are quite different to deal with um, than um, neurotypical professionals. So that's lateral. Longitudinal, of course, we need to look at, you know, as things progress, technology progresses, artificial intelligence becomes more part of our society, that we are able to adapt and, you know, um, effectively and smartly um, deal with these um, challenges and these changes. So I think there's two dimensions to it which we need to be cognizant of. Okay, that's a really important um, reflection, Klaus, about that, not just the responsible use, but making sure that we're training AI to be, you know, um, a trainer on the margins, not just for, for the centre for that that um, typical middle-aged white male population, but for, for all of those populations. So, you know, moving on to reflecting about data, same question for you, Mark, given, um, you know, our, our previous two panellists, you know, have a very health focus and I'm very aware, acutely aware of how we um, train our health professionals around cultural competency. What about within the data world? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, at Amazon, we believe our full future is inclusive, uh, diverse and equitable across every identity, whether that's race identity, gender identity, belief, origin and community. Um, so we purposefully take um, an approach to cultivating a culture of inclusion uh, and that's including hiring, retaining um, diverse uh, talent. Uh, we, uh, it's it's just super important, right? So uh, as the uh, customers, as our customers change uh, in terms of increasing, becoming increasingly diverse, it's important that we hire um, and and train and retain uh, diverse talent in order to um, better serve those customers. But one of our leadership principles is that success and scale brings broad responsibility and it reminds us that we must support our customers, our partners, local communities, the world at large and also ourselves uh, to do better and be better. Yeah, thanks Mark and, and David from the uh, aerospace perspective. Oh, Aaron, sorry, well, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, simply say that, you know, diversity, um, uh, the, the problem solving I mentioned, you know, coming up with uh, step changes to technology, or, which is essentially a, you know, a solution to problems um, or even a solution to problems we don't know of yet. Uh, diversity is, is absolutely key to that. And so, you know, leveraging cultural differences where you can. Um, I've seen some amazing, you know, amazing uh, ideas and talent come through. <clears throat> um, you know, for example, you know, teams working in Australia, um, when we work with uh, our, our peers in Japan, in Korea, India, uh, it's amazing what new ideas come up and, and what um, and new solutions come up and even even new products come together because uh, we simply don't know what we don't know and, and it takes that, that diverse. So recognising that there are differences and recognising that those differences will make you stronger. Um, even if in the short term, there's often a bit of learning and, and getting to know something or getting to know one another. It's absolutely critical to recognise that. And, and honestly, companies, uh, business outcomes and you know, your workplace is better with, with a, um, you know, a diverse range of people you know, pulling together, sharing and frankly having fun. And, and <laughs> That's the important part. Yeah. yeah and <laughs> And the, as you've reflected, we, um, in, we're not restrained by geographical borders and often we are global um, employees now. So we are working with people, um, not just with our culturally diverse populations within our Australian workforces, but with our international partnerships as well. Again, I'm going to shift the, chain, the, the focus a little bit um, to another question that came up um, before the as part of the registration and and this is something that a few of you actually touched upon um, in your presentations and it's around that hybrid work models 
So the question is, do hybrid work models improve work-life ba work balance or does it reduce the productivity and efficiency of work? Mark, I'll start with you. Uh, thanks, Karen. It's, it's, it's hard to believe, isn't it? But it's been nearly three years since the pandemic began. Um, and uh, back in 2020, uh, we started working from home um, pretty much full time. I think for, for us, it was February, uh, February 2020 in Australia, or well, certainly in Melbourne. Um, so we changed gardens a couple of times uh, since then, um, but we, we saw different models. Right? Obviously, we uh, through, through the lockdowns, uh, we saw complete remote with folks working exclusively from home. Uh, some after after lockdowns ended or in different localities as a global organization, we operate in, in many different places. Uh, so some folks started to go back to work uh, in the office more quickly. And we saw lots of different hybrid approaches as things ebbed and flowed uh, over time. Um, and so uh, more recently, I think it was in uh, February, we, we moved to a hybrid uh, approach to uh, three days a week in the office in, in certain places. And there's a few things um, that we saw that made that led us to that. And the first thing is I touched on earlier earlier on in, in the um, the ownership, and it's easier to uh, to see, we, we we believe very strongly in, in our culture, our leadership principles, and it's easier to model, uh, practice, learn, and strengthen that culture when we're in the same room. You can do it remotely, but it's more challenging. It's a lot easier when you when you're in person. I've got like every every organisation has their own culture. Uh, I'm not pretending that ours is ours best. It's just one that works uh, it works well for us. And so digesting that information, being with other people in a room, being able to continue a conversation uh, because you've had a whiteboarding session and you really want to focus on one idea uh, when you when you're doing it remotely, the, the meeting ends and that's kind of it. And unless you're super intentional about it by reaching out to that person continue that conversation it, it can be quite it can't be what it's not necessarily fluid uh, whereas when you're in the office you can say oh I'm, everyone's going to break for lunch it's like oh i might sort of grab a colleague and say hey, i really was interested in that idea let's explore that in more depth so you can be more natural more fluid that's a lot easier to do in person not impossible to do remotely but it's a lot easier to do in person so that kind of collaborating and inventing and, and riffing off other people's ideas um is is, is much easier um, and also learning from each other is, is easier in person. Being able to walk a few steps down the uh, down a corridor and, and ask someone a question. So I, asked, I saw that you asked that question in a meeting. What, what was your intent behind that question? And uh, that kind of learning from others, that kind of experiential learning. Again, you can do it remotely. It's not impossible. It's just a lot easier to do in person. If I think about as a solution architect, we're field facing, so we work directly with customers. And a lot of my learning in my first couple of years, I've been with Amazon for about five years, was in the meeting, in the post post meeting uh, drive to the to, to the next customer where you know I chat with my account manager and say, hey, you know, that how did that meeting go, how did it learn, what do you what do you see, who's a who's a supporter, who's a who's a detractor, uh, and so on. Um, and that 15 minutes of learning, you, you, it's very difficult to do that remotely. So I think that hybrid approach being respectful of other people's times and the way that the world has changed, um, but also being much more intentional about how we spend our time in the office. I think that's going to be super important. That kind of intentional activity uh, is super important as opposed to just, just going straight back to the office full time. I think that's uh, it's, uh, the, that kind of hybrid approach that works really well for us. Yeah, I, I so miss the, the water cooler chats. The, the kitchen lunchroom chats. Well, what about you, David? I mean, we are flying again. Um, and you know, how's it changed within your environment? Well, we are flying, and and absolutely, you know, we went from a you know, a forced you know virtual work, which which really um, for some of our teams it almost stopped them in their tracks because they weren't able to connect and team effectively. Um, we've now you know moved on, and, and, and you know production rates in our factories are increasing, and, and opportunities on new products for our digital and our design work is increasing. So. Um, similar to what Mark said, you know that that three days a week, four days a week, um, you know, we really work with with our local team um, to uh, you know to make sure that we balance the work on site, and I've called it the teaming work. But you know the connections, the um, the direct, you know, the direct conversations, but also the value of indirect conversations, and also as Mark mentioned, mentoring, um, seeing your leaders, seeing how they behave in situations. You simply haven't heard me, you know, um, you know, my reaction to good news or bad news. You know, my team won't see me if it's virtual. I've turned off the camera, but they, you know, they'll definitely see me, you know, when they're with me in the room, so to speak. So that's important. Um, yeah, the virtual element of the work is important too. 
Um, I mentioned also about trust and one of the challenges that you can have with a team doing on-site and off-site work is is people pointing fingers at one another you know he's in she's in therefore I can or cannot do my work and so what we really do and what we've in, in um, continue to support is that that trust within the team that hey we need to be in because something's happened let's get together and kind of huddle if you like or or um, I mentioned Agile, you know, we've got a, a demo day. Let's make sure we're all in for the demo. Let's make sure we're polished on our presentation skills and we give a good outcome. Uh, and so that's that's been really important um, you know, for us. We also have teams that, you know, un are unable to work, you know, virtually, if you like, because they're you know, supporting a factory or equipment. And so, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, they continue to work that that way. But but again, our factories are large, you know, <laughs> it, it can take a, a long time to even get from one side of a car park to another. So, um, you know, vir vir virtually working, it, it, you know, you can take that in many senses. But but I do think um, teams trusting one another, teams understanding their work statement, and then those connections with leaders and customers. Um, there's some things that you can't do virtually, but you've got to be very specific about what you're going to do on site. Um, celebration of events, food is always great. Uh, coffees, uh, birthdays, uh, and also successes, you know, um, are great to get together on. Often we get together on failures because, you know, the boss is upset or we need to go fix something. We've been very mindful to bring people together and say, hey, let's get together because we've had some success and, and it'll be a, a lunch or a morning tea or, or some other event. And I think that's really important. That's a really good reflection, David. Um, I, I know my step count certainly um, took a, a hammering when we had all of those lockdowns, um, and uh, but maybe my waistline didn't from the uh, lack of cakes for that period of time. Klaus, you have a real real helicopter view across a number of different industries as your role as, as um, president with Precious Australia. Are you seeing um, much differences or changes across those different industries or what insights well, have you had? We're seeing a very broad diversity and fracturing also. Uh, I mean, the question was about hybrid work. I mean, we have professions and professionals who are completely switched to online and working and remote working, full stop. Um, then we have another cohort that's talking about the four day work week rather than the five day work week, which sounds more like you know, um, being able to, um, you know, be, be, being having to work at a certain location um, and, you know, is sort of probably more um, coming from the legacy of the six day work week, the five day work, the four day work week. But of course, you know, Dave, if you're running a factory or or if one's, you know, running a, um, a large enterprise um, may be of relevance. We we see, you know, people like Elon Musk saying uh, basically putting down people who work remotely. Um, and so we have a, a, a fracturing, I think, of, of, of views. Our thinking is that the fracturing of views is a sign of that um, society in general, not only Australians, but global, is trying to make up its mind where we're going to go. Now, my background, I'm an economist. I know things about industrial revolutions. Some, some of us are saying we're going back to work circumstances prior to the Industrial Revolution, where basically could, people can actually work where they live. The work comes to the people where they live, in their families, in their local communities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now that doesn't work in the aircraft factory. I appreciate that, but there is some areas of work where that's actually happening where people are finding a new sense of work, a new purpose of work, because they can now suddenly combine the things they've always wanted to do, like looking after elders or looking after children, which they couldn't do before, and they had daycare mums because they had to go to an office block. And some of these things are really, I think, disrupting the thinking, and that's why we're getting a broad spread of views and um, I think a fracturing of where different organisations appear to currently be going, I think the overall view is that it's going to take a couple of years to settle down and then we'll see maybe where the direction overall is heading. But ultimately, many people have experienced during the lockdowns things they'd never in their working lives experienced before and they're saying, hey, I want to continue doing that. Yeah, couldn't agree more. 
Um, and, and Megan, you actually talked about this during your presentation. Yeah, um, I guess setting those boundaries are so important when you are working remotely. Um, in healthcare, it's, it's mainly in person. Um, my team is largely clinical, so um, like David, um, you can't really get away from not coming to work. Um, however, we really are striving to, to try and find that balance. Um, during COVID, a lot of our teams had to be split because they couldn't actually um, be physically near each other because if one team went down, team B had to be on the ground. So, you know, we couldn't even have shared tea rooms, shared desk spaces. Um, everything was completely separate. So we did work out how to be a little bit remote um, in, in some of the tasks that we had to do. And a lot of my team really enjoyed that. They do enjoy being able to go to the gym in the morning um, and, and, you know, walk, walking straight in, um, having a shower and sitting down at your computer instead of um, losing out on your commute time, um, you know, dropping off the kids at school. Everyone has found a little bit more of a balance. Um, but I really think this is all about self-awareness. Um, I think some people can work beautifully remotely or in a hybrid situation. Other people People crave people. Um, you know, I've got colleagues that um, will walk up to me and interrupt me 17 times during the day. Um, so depending on what I'm working on, sometimes it's better like I'm doing right now. I'm locked myself in an office <laughs> and I may as well be at home then. Um, so I think it really just depends on the person. And if you have the, enough self-awareness to be able to figure out um, who you are as a person, you can figure out how productive you can be in either a hybrid, completely remote or, or completely in-person model. Yeah, thanks, Megan. And um, I think the reason why I come to work is to try and uh, lock myself away from all those interruptions at home. Um, so we do have a question in our Q&A uh, for Mark that I do want to um, put to Mark. But before I do, again, I just encourage our audience, if you have any questions for our attendee, uh, for our panellists, please do put them into the Q&A so I can make sure I share them um, before we end the session. So Mark, there was a question in the Q&A and it was thinking about the key skills AWS looks for <laughs> in employees. How would you guide a recent graduate to build some of these skills that would appear not to directly relate to a degree? Uh, yeah, thanks, Karen. It's good. Yeah, good, good question. So um, if I think about some of the, I try to be reasonably broad because uh, Amazon Web Services and Amazon more broadly, of course, we hire for lots of different roles from software development engineers to solution architects to legal counsel to uh, data scientists and, and so on. So I didn't want to focus too much specifically on, on the kind of technical skills. Uh, the, te the technical skills are still important. If you're a software development engineer, you know, we need to have an understanding of whether you are, have familiarity with the programming language or uh, you've got some experience developing software and, and, and so on. I won't discuss any of the uh, roles, so that they're they're still extremely important. Uh, and there's different ways you can develop the, those skills uh, from a university context, or academic context, or uh, through uh, coding boot camps and so on. Uh, but we do strongly need those those technical skills or those technical skills that are relevant to a particular role. If I think about, say, learning to be curious, um, and and so early on in your career, um, you may not have the opportunity to demonstrate this from from a professional perspective. You, know, you may have done internships. Uh, or you may have um, done some kind of extracurricular activities and so on. But what what we're really looking for is kind of example behavior. So you know, do you do you do you look under look around corners? Do you look under rocks and see how things work? You know, so if you've used a tool, did you did you uh, so like an open source tool or something of that nature to do uh, some work with a university course? Did you did you download it from GitHub or, or GitLab or whatever and, and start tinkering around with it and working on it? Did you did you seek to like how does this work? How can I make this better? That kind of activity. But they're the kinds of they're the kinds of experiences that we're looking for. If we're thinking around bias for action, it can be from a university course. If you're working with um, a, a group on a university uh, pr project or something of that nature, you know, you, you saw a problem uh, and we might ask, is like, did you see a problem and, and do something about it? And it's like, if you if you looked ahead, if you were proactive about spotting that there was a problem upcoming, perhaps you, you saw there was an issue with the approach that you were taking, did you, uh, did you stay silent or did you raise that respectfully with the rest of your group and, and proactively to put, to put a solution in place to, to solve it? So there's a number of different ways in which you can do that, both from an academic, you can demonstrate these kind of LPs and I, I do strongly encourage
encourage folks who are interested in a career at AWS or Amazon more broadly to, to familiarize yourself with our, with our LPs because we, we do use them genuine, generally, genuinely use them every day. Um, and, and think about experiences that you've had that, that, lend, that lend them themselves towards those LPs because it doesn't have to be a professional experience. It could be academic, it could be extracurricular, it could be sports related. It, it really doesn't matter. So hopefully that's that's helped um, help people yeah, think about Mark. Uh, how we think about those LPs, so sorry. No, I was just reflecting that, you know, that advice is so relevant across all industries. Um, and I think everyone, I was watching the rest of our panelists that were nodding along with you. So um, really um, great advice that is, is very global um, and can be extend across all different areas. So I do have one final question for our panelists. Once upon a time, we used to talk about, you know, uh, as a future skill that we need to have computer literacy. Now, AI has come up time and time again throughout this presentation. It is coming up time and time again, you know, in the media. Um, it's being raised in our, you know, even just our, um, our, our programs that we offer here at RMIT. It is pretty much part of every conversation that I certainly, you know, am having with industry and, um, you know, with different areas of the sector for me within health. So, you know, um, I'm sort of reflecting, you know, now we've sort of moved from that, um, that, you know, making sure that we've got computer literacy to do we actually need to make sure that we've got AI literacy? Um, I put that to um, each of you. Uh, each of our panellists um, and I'm going to start with our very first panellist being Mark. Oh, thanks. I get to talk again. So uh, AI, is, AI is super, super important and um, at Amazon we've been we were thinking about, and thinking about and, and using AI and machine learning in, in many of our services uh, from you know, book recommendations on Amazon.com many years ago to uh, some of our more modern services um, uh, that we, we provide as well from uh, Alexa or Amazon Go, no checkout stores and things of that nature. So we've always been thinking about how we can find practical use uh, for these kind of technologies. Um, but if I think about it, I'm a software engineer by trade. Um, so I, I develop software for a living uh, and of course there's tools out there with, with chat GPT and, and various other services that that provide um, some of uh, some support to, to folks when they're thinking about uh, developing code but if I think about that specific use case and, and developing code um, yeah we, there's various different services that we have available like Amazon Code Whisperer which, which supports software developers in, in thinking through um, how they can uh, spe speeding up the way that they develop code but it, that kind of the systems thinking the overarching um, how are we actually going to build all of this together to put it into a large system that's actually scalable and is going to work well and is going to solve a problem that's super important you still need to think about how you take that large complex system and break it down into decomposable parts that you then can use ai to help inform the way that you approach it but going to klaus's uh, comments he made before around the professional advice you still have to have that base level of understanding to interpret the guidance or the information that things like generative AI is providing you to be assured that it's the right thing to do. It's very powerful, but that kind of fundamental knowledge is still required to correctly interpret and apply that, that information in the way that's going to be meaningful uh, for customers. Thanks very much, Mark. Megan, what about within health? So healthcare is a little bit different. Um, I guess when it comes to diagnosis, um, I actually read a, an article this morning saying that AI um, were better at diagnosing stroke victims um, when they called through um, to emergency services than the people were, um, which is quite fascinating. And um, there's a huge amount of work, uh, work being done in the, the screening um, uh, sector in healthcare. Um, and we can certainly use it um, for things like mole mapping for skin cancer and some really, really interesting things coming Coming through. Um, we're busy looking at it for data mining. Um, so real world data is um, a huge <laughs> revenue source um, for many companies and in health it's extremely important. We need to be able to know exactly what um, cancers we've seen in the, our country, what are our risk factors, um, what treatments are being used um, in order to develop the next line of therapies for us. So um, it, it's big in healthcare, but um, exactly like Mark said, you you do need that human element. Um, even if um, an AI bot could um, detect a stroke victim um, faster than a person could or more accurately, they can't be the ones who treat them. Well, not yet anyway. <laughs> Watch the space. 
agree. And Klaus, I know you've got some really great insights in health, but also, you know, those other industries. Um, and I actually did a presentation for you um, last year, I think it was, on um, ethical and responsible use of AI. What's your thoughts on this? Well, I think um, fortunately or unfortunately, AI, is, I think, has progressed and permeated the work of professionals a lot more than we actually realise or um, you know, I see this all around me. Um, the, you know, Megan, um, your um, 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 observations regarding you know a diagnosis are very um, um, are very true, um, and I see it people using it personally. Um, I uh, there was one famous example where somebody um, um, had a chat GPT compose a uh, a love letter to his uh, his wife for her anniversary. And when I read it, I thought that was pretty good. So I'm thinking that this will permeate much more quickly, much more of our society. So we need to be basically aware and alert that information that we get confronted with, and it could be source, it could be code, it could be text, it could be articles, it could be students work, it could be anything, could be generated with the help of AI or by AI. Um, so I think we need to just, um, regarding the literacy, AI literacy, absolutely need to be um, alert that information could be created by AI. If it's being created by, what are the you know, parameters under which it's created and how is it being used? And uh, more importantly, you know, has it been verified? Um, so we certainly need to be alert and literate about what AI can do and is currently doing, you know, as we are sitting here. Um, and, you know, journalists are getting stuff written by AI. Um, magazines are, have gone on record saying they're having some of their articles uh, co-written by AI. AI is here. So literally is essential. That's it. Thank you, Klaus. And certainly not just of our workforce, but of our consumer and citizen populations as well. David, any final thoughts from you with regards to AI literacy? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, it's, it's absolutely uh, critical to have a, a basic understanding of, of you know, what what AI is and maybe for um, for the field that we're in in aerospace, we can all easily think about the sort of sci fi picture of, uh, you know, <laughs> autonomous vehicles flying around without you know, developing trust for people um, to do those things. But the reality is that there are multiple layers, right, of, of the ability to apply this technology. Um, I'll link it to, you know, machine learning as well. Some of the really fundamental uh, work that we do in, um, in much of our factories and, and where we design our platforms and the way our aircraft in particular, um, you, know, uh, you know, operated, but also service that machine learning has a huge amount of benefits. And in fact, one of the, the reasons why we are making step changes in some of our factories, our designs, and the way that our customers operate and use our, our aircraft and platforms is because of the uh, the large amount of data that we can gather, you know, in our production systems or on the aircraft, but we can, we can then pull that data together and, and make informed decisions at various levels on, hey, We've got maintenance issues here, or we've got heads up on uh, servicing, or hey, we've got some decision making to go around um, weather, or uh, or the way that an aircraft platform behaves. So there's multiple layers, and so it's really important that people have that that fundamental understanding. It's a really rich area as well. I mentioned the word rich because every time we take a close look at a problem, um, and, and we apply some AI, machine learning, or data gathering and sorting to help solve that problem. Um, more and more it's helping solve it. So within our company, uh, there's actually a growing division and a growing need for, um, you know, for what we'll call autonomy, but, um, you know, AI and ML and software development, and it's only going to grow in the future. So for graduates, you know, pr prospective students, um, you know, it's a great growth area. It's, it's um, for our platforms, it's, it's in factories and it's in our, you know, in the products you fly. On, on your next holiday, uh, you have a think about all the the um, the background data that's been generated as you fly uh, to and from, uh, getting you to your destination, but also getting you safely there, and, and making sure that um, you know, everything's operating efficiently. It, it's an amazing space, and there's a lot of development there. So, the fundamentals are really important. Yeah, thank you very much, David. And uh, I think it's uh, AI has really highlighted. Um, 
Yeah, well, the media is really highlighted how much AI is actually already there integrated with a lot of our lives. And uh, it's about making sure our citizens are, are aware of this and um, certainly our graduates as well. I know universities, Cass, um, will certainly be aware of this because of his involvement um, also with Universities Australia. Universities are still really divided on this topic and we saw when ChatGPT was launched in the media, there was a lot of discussion about whether universities were going to block it or allow it and RMIT is certainly on the side of allowing it, um, not blocking the technology I should say, but being able to explore how we can safely embrace and use um, AI um, in this area. We have received another question. I apologise to that person that we haven't, we've run our time to be able to come to your question, um, but it certainly is something that each of our panellists have um, talked around the topic of um, the fact that during these lockdowns, our students haven't been able to necessarily go into the workplaces and have those in-person work integrated learning opportunities. Uh, and I know so many of our program managers and academic teams that have worked hard to be able to make sure our, our graduates here at RMIT have had rich learning experiences and are work ready to be able to go into um, the workforce. This is coming up to the end of our session. And I actually want to be able to thank our speakers using text that AI has generated for me just to be able to show how much it really does can be able to nail the session. So I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to each of you and to everyone to attending, but to our panelists and to those that have organised this event. Your presence has made this event a resounding success, very presumptuous there, but I think it was, um, and truly meaningful. It is an honour to be able to share, hear from you, all of your insights and knowledge, um, and your participation has created a really thought-provoking conversation and very valuable contributions. I think AI has nailed it there. I now want to say thank you very much to each of our panellists. We've had a really uh, interesting discussion uh, today and I hope our audience has uh, been able to get some great insights from our panellists about what's happening in industry uh, in this new world. Thank you to our panellists. I'd also like to thank um, our organisers for today. Firstly, I'd like to express a lot of appreciation to Michelle Nico, um, who goes out of her way to be able to organise um, these events. I'd also like to thank um, my colleagues who are a part of this um, initiative that is brought to you today, um, uh, including Magdalena Pavlansky, um, uh, sorry, I'm opening up my chat. Um, Michelle Spencer, who is our acting chair right now, um, whilst um, James Harland is on leave. Matt Dackham, uh, Xavier uh, Moulet, um, and apologies uh, if I have forgotten anyone else on that list. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank Ryan as well, who has been operating the AV in the background for us. Um, and thank you to the audience for attending this session. It's without your attendance um, that uh, these events would not be held. Thank you very much to everyone.